welcome again. Uh, we are going to get started. Um, I just want to put some Zoom etiquette in the chat feature just for all of you all. It looks like everyone is already muted, so we're good there. But just a reminder uh, to please keep your microphone muted, muted while the presentation is going on. Um, and please submit any questions that you have via the chat window, or you can raise your hand and we'll have designated time at the end uh, for questions um, that you all might have. Um, but this session is entitled Community Collaboration to Achieve Collective Impact from the Collaborative Organization of Services for Youth and Adults. Our presenter is Fred Lida. Fred Lida serves as the Director of Beaufort County Human Services. He has worked in the human service arena with delinquent youth, as well as mentally, behaviorally, and emotionally handicapped children for over 30 years. In 2001, Mr. Lida received the John Beretti Community Service Award from Low Country Legal Volunteers for his exceptional collaborative accomplishments in the human services community. And I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thanks, Teresa. Welcome everyone. Uh, as Teresa said, I'm the human services director for Buford County. And in that role, I facilitate two processes. One is called COZI, the Collaborative Organization of Services for Youth and its sister program, COZA, Collaborative Organization of Services for Adults, and also a network that we call the Human Services Alliance, which is a, a group of organizations, over 120 organizations, that have developed into an organizational framework that we call Together for Buford County. So the purpose of our presentation today is to talk about how to achieve collective impact using community collaboration. So let's start with the definition of collective impact. It is an intentional way of working together and sharing information for the purpose of solving a complex problem. Next slide. So it's important to understand that this is a framework and that is a tool that helps us organize all the different agencies into effective teams or work groups to improve the quality of life in our community. It's a tool to develop and maintain the foundational principles that facilitate ongoing collaborative activities. Next slide. So what does that look like? Well, we started by conducting a series of interviews, community conversations, discussions, and surveys across our county to ask what are the most important issues impacting quality of life? And from this process, we identified five sectors health, education, environment, social well-being, and economy. Once we established those as the sectors, we then organized ourselves into work groups or coalitions that would begin to try to have an impact on each of those sectors. So these five sectors, we have about 17 work groups or coalitions, dozens of agencies, and hundreds of partners are all organized around common goals and objectives as you see pictured here on the screen. Next slide. So how does that work? As I'm sure you can see, all of these sectors are interrelated. For example, education has a direct impact on economy, but health and social well-being have direct impacts on education too. So all of them are interconnected with each other. Personally, my background is in marine biology. And I think that one of the reasons I've been successful in developing our community collaboration efforts is because whether I'm dealing with a single celled organism, an animal, a person, a family, a neighborhood, a community, I see them all as organic and we have to deal with them holistically. A family or a community is not a clock. You can't open up the back, take out the broken piece, fix it, put it back in there and close it back up and expect that everything's gonna work. We're not widgets. As soon as you open the back, you've broken us. We're people, organic beings who exist on multiple levels simultaneously. But this is not as, as impossible as it might seem. There are a few key fundamental elements that have led to our success. And these elements can be applied in any community and to a wide variety of circumstances that require collaborative effort. 
So these key elements are foundational for success for almost all collaborative efforts. Next slide. So we use this model called collective impact. It's funny because when we started doing this, they hadn't defined collective impact yet. We were doing it and people came along later afterwards and said, hey, we just figured this thing out. This is collective impact. And we're like, yeah, well, we've been doing it for 25 years. Um, but it describes an intentional way, as I said before, of working together and sharing information for the purpose of solving complex problems. The elements that I'm going to go through today are shared vision and common agenda, shared measurement system, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and a backbone organization. Next slide. So first, shared vision. The partners in a collaborative have to agree to a shared vision resulting from a thorough data-driven understanding of the issues being addressed culminating with an agreed agenda and framework to address them. First, you've got to know the facts. Then select a particular metric that's relevant, measurable, actionable, and realistic. So as an example, when we first started, one of our work groups was called the Water Quality Coalition, and they were looking at the uh, the health of the rivers and streams in our community. A big part of our economy is tied to uh, tourism and people come here because of the beautiful environment that we live in. If we trash that environment, we're going to be hurting ourselves economically because of the in tourist industry. So this work group was looking at the quality of the water, not in our drinking water, but in the rivers and streams that are in our community. Initially, they chose as one of their metrics to measure the success of their work, um, shellfish bed closures. Because we were thinking that when uh, shellfish beds are closed, that's an indication of poor water quality. So we should be able to use the closure of the oyster beds to measure that. Well, it wasn't long after we started that we had a group of biologists in a room who went, uh, wait a minute, you're measuring the quality of water based on how often the oyster beds are closed. So you want a drought? And we said, wait, what, what, what are you talking about? No, we don't want a drought. And they said, well, whenever there's a, a lot of rain, that fresh water flowing over those oyster beds causes all those oysters to close up. And once they close up, the bacteria count inside that shell starts going up. And that bed now becomes toxic and can't be harvested. So we close the beds. So using the shellfish beds clo closures as a as a metric, while it was me uh, measurable, it really wasn't relevant because it was measuring something completely different. And so what we switched to was measuring things like pH, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, fecal coliform bacteria, things that actually told us about the health of the water. So it was important that while we had chosen a metric, it has to be relevant and it also has to be actionable and realistic. It doesn't do us any good if we are saying that the problem we have is tied to minimum wage. We don't have any control over minimum wage, so it's not an actionable measurement. So let me give you um, another real life example. Next slide. Back in 2009, we were asked by the Housing and Urban Development HUD to help out with what's called a point in time count. Some of you may be familiar with this idea. Every two years back then, uh, HUD would conduct these events to try to get a sense of how many homeless people were in a community. One of our work groups, the Community Services Organization, that is uh, a, uh, a group of all of the food, clothing, and shelter providers, churches, nonprofits, and so forth in the community, we went to them and said, okay, HUD wants us to get a sense of how many homeless people there are in, in our community how do you think we should go about this? Uh, because what HUD was suggesting is that we do street counts. We go out on the street, we interview people, and we find out how many people are homeless. Um, obviously, the problem that we had as a community with that was, well, great, you're going to ask these folks to come out of the woods to be counted, but you don't have any shelter to put them in. So what are you going to say after you get them to come out? Gee, thanks for coming. Now go back into the woods. So we created an event that we call Everyone Counts was an annual event that was designed to make needed services available to the homeless individuals in our community. We had 
mental health. We had adult ed to talk about getting a GED or writing a resume. We had alcohol and drug abuse counselors. We had dentists, doctors. We even had com cosmetologists and barbers and many others who attended from all over all the different sectors in our community. And they all gathered around a common agenda and a shared vision, that is helping individuals experiencing homelessness. The next element is a shared measurement system. Next slide. Partners must adopt a shared set of key performance indicators or KPIs in order to measure collective success. Pictured here are excerpts from our newly released Together for Buford County Indicators Report. This report is a critical tool that allows us to rally partners around common causes. But more importantly, it ensures that we all know the facts about the realities in our communities, not anecdotes, not rumors, or politically driven narratives, the facts. Next slide. When we first began our indicators project, next slide. Uh, I guess the slide's taken a little while, there we go. Um, when we first began looking at doing our indicators project, we did a literature review and all of our research indicated that there was an organization in Florida called the Jacksonville Community Council Incorporated. It was shown in all the literature to be the gold standard for this type of work. And so we spent months reviewing their reports, interviewing their director and various community partners to better understand the undertaking. They had about 20 or 30 years under their belt. So it was clear that they knew what they were doing and we wanted to learn from the best. So we learned the importance of establishing a baseline for our data and measuring trends over time. Next slide. The next element is mutually reinforcing activities. The implementation of the agreed plan must include coordinated activities that are clearly defined and mutually agreed upon. These activities must all, or at least multiple partners must benefit. If one partner benefits at the expense of another, you're only breeding resentment and distrust. In a successful collaborative, all of the partners have agreed to come to the table because they have something to offer. You don't want folks sitting at a collaborative table who are there to see what they can get. They need to be there to see how they can, as a community of providers, assist the larger group in achieving its goals. Each partner in a collaborative enhances the capacity of the others in some way. Basically, this is where collective impact formalizes into actual business relationships. Often we have memorandums of agreement or memorandums of understanding between partners, and everyone needs to feel like they're getting a good deal. The beauty of a good collaborative gives you all the strengths and assets of the partners around the table, but none of their weaknesses or limitations, because what one partner can do, another maybe can't. So instead of problem solving and reaching an impasse where you say, well, we can't do that, you look for a partner who has the capacity to do that and you bring them into the collaborative. I'll go more deeply into these, into some examples of mutually reinforcing activities in the second half of my presentation. Next slide. Another element is continuous communication. I can't overemphasize how important good communication is in a collaborative project. Partners must agree to communicate thoroughly with one another in order to maintain the shared vision, the joint planning, and the coordinated execution of the action plan. This requires establishing a common language, which is not as easy as it sounds. We might all speak English, but we use it differently in different situations. You can't just meet someone once and assume that the relationship, both with the person and with their agency, will be maintained forever. Things change, people change, rules change, and cultures change over time. All of this requires continuous communication so that there's an ongoing relationship that's, that's being maintained and developed. Next slide. So let's talk about a backbone organization. Collective impact must be supported by some type of a backbone organization that provides vision and strategy, support activities, 
creates a shared measurement system, builds public positive will to achieve the project, advances policy, and helps obtain the necessary funds. In this role, you need an organization that has a vested interest, but not a specific interest in the subject. Someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight so that they can truly be a neutral convening partner. This organization becomes your cheerleader. The agency may not have the capacity to do the work itself, but they will facilitate opportunities to enhance pre-existing activities and facilitate growth and expansion through funding, advocacy, and other means. This is one of the hardest for a brand new collaborative because of the specific requirements to be a successful backbone organization. The organization has to be neutral and impartial, but with a vested interest, as I said, in the successful outcome of the proposed activity. They must have social and political capital. It must be reliable. It must be respected. And lastly, and most importantly, it has to be trusted by all the partners and must continually work to earn and maintain this trust. The existence of a truly neutral and impartial, impartial convener, independent of any of the partner organizations, cannot be overemphasized. If one of the partner agencies is perceived as being in charge, all the other partners are going to feel free to step back and let them handle it. They're in charge. They're responsible. Instead, having a neutral, independent facilitator allows the group to stay focused on the agenda and provides them with someone to actually do the work. Everybody in the group has a full-time job. Let's face it, they don't have time to take on the extra tasks necessary to accomplish the work of the collaborative. But by pooling their resources and hiring an independent facilitator, the work of the group can continually be effective and both the partners and the community will benefit. Next slide. So when you put all of this together, you get something that looks like this. The Human Services Alliance leverages its resources, depicted on this screen on the left side, and its network to support the activities of all its various work groups, shown on the right side of your screen. One of the ways we do this is through a contract with the Department of Health and Human Services. In this case, it's a Medicaid administrative match contract that allows us to take local funds garnered in support of our initiative and match them with federal funds. Nothing's easier to talk to a donor about contributing money when you can tell them that you're immediately going to be able to double whatever he gives through this match contract. So now let's look at some specific examples. The first collaborative team that our community developed is called COSI, Collaborative Organization of Services for Youth. I mentioned it earlier. Started in 1994, this multidisciplinary collaborative process brings all of our youth service agencies around a table to develop a coordinated treatment plan for children and families with therapeutic needs. COSI is not a nonprofit. It's not an entity of itself. It's a process. If at any point, the directors of the agencies that make up the COSI process were to wake up one morning and decide this isn't working, COSI would cease to exist. But for the last 26 years, it's continued because all of the directors of the agencies involved have seen the value of this type of collaborative effort. What it allows in our community is that any family in Buford County with a child from birth to 21 years of age can come before this team they can tell their story one time, all the agencies are there to hear it, and th these are supervisors from these agencies. So it's not just a caseworker, it's someone who actually has the authority to speak on behalf of their agency. That system, that process, engages the parents so that they become a part of the team discussions directly. That way they're able to help the team better understand their individual circumstances in their family. So let's give you an example. Let's say that we have a, a middle school child. He's having trouble in school. Mom has found some Adidas in his room. She knows she didn't buy him. So she's thinking maybe he's been shoplifting. She's found a little bit of uh, drug paraphernalia. She suspects he might be smoking marijuana. 
And she's been told in the past that he probably has attention deficit disorder. Now, before Cozy existed, that family would have to go to four different agencies, school district to talk about the challenges there, alcohol and drug abuse to talk about the marijuana issue, mental health to talk about his ADHD, and juvenile justice to talk about the shoplifting. But this is a common kind of a scenario because what's going on typically is the child is not being treated for his ADHD. So he's self-medicating with the marijuana. Because of that, he can't afford that. So he's shoplifting so that he can get the money to buy the marijuana. And as a combination of all of them, he's having trouble in school. So this would be a common scenario that would be appropriate for this child and family to come before the COSY team so that all the various agencies, not just those four, but all the agencies that are a member of the team can hear the situation, the circumstances that are involved and leverage their knowledge, their wisdom, their experience, uh, their knowledge of resources in the community to help flesh out a coordinated plan that will assist that family. Collective impact reinforces how important communication is for this to be successful. Each and every relationship must be continually maintained and everyone has to be getting value out of the process. That includes the parents and the agencies that sit around the table. Next slide, please. Another example is another one of our work groups, the Early Childhood Coalition. So typically every year there are about 2000 births that occur in our county and over 1900 of those mothers are approached by a volunteer who says, is there anything you're worried about? Are you scared about how you're gonna feed your baby or where you're going to live, how you're going to raise your child? If so, that mother is offered what we call the universal staffing, a process that brings all of our parent education, education programs together to conduct individualized multidisciplinary team discussions. These are designed to develop coordinated treatment plans for the family being assisted. Unlike COSY, where the parents are actually sitting at the table and participating, in this situation, the parents are either about to give birth or they've just recently given birth and we figure they got enough on their plate. They don't need to come to a meeting. And so we typically send a, a worker from one of the programs out to the home to do an assessment and that individual then comes back and reports to the team on the circumstances in the family and a treatment plan is developed. This process puts a home visiting parent educator in the home of that child for sometimes up to five years working with that family. And you can imagine that this is a tremendous opportunity to build a rapport of trust and mutual respect with an individual who has access to resources in the community. So let's say three, four years after the child has been born, when a challenge comes up in the home and the family is struggling to overcome it, they already have a ready-made relationship with a, a parent educator who can connect them with the larger resources of the community. All of the network that has been put together through the Alliance can be brought to bear to assist that family. Again, from a collective impacts perspective, this is an excellent example of mutually reinforcing activities. Each agency's activities enhance the capacity of their partners. Another example I'll give you here that this group uses is our traveling preschool bus. Next slide, please. So what we did was we took a, uh, an old blood mobile and we gutted it and rebuilt. If you look there at the bottom left, you'll see the interior of the bus. We rebuilt it into uh, basically a traveling preschool classroom. This vehicle travels around our county to preschools, festivals, public service agencies, and even shopping mall parking lots to allow young children and their parents to access its resources. Once you get on the bus, you see the uh, typical kindergarten classroom. This is a way of helping to reduce anxiety for children who are going to be moving from preschool into kindergarten to give them a sense of what a kindergarten will look like. But it also allows the child, the uh, child care workers who come on board from the preschools to see what a real good quality child care classroom should look like. If you notice in the back of the room, you see two doors. One on the right is used to provide 
private interviews where parents and parent educators can sit at a table and discuss circumstances. And the other is a space that can be used to provide hearing and vision screening so that there can be multiple purposes that the bus is used for as it travels around the community. Another example of what this coalition has been able to achieve is our early learning standards program helping to improve services in local independently owned child care centers. The coalition also conducts a combined marketing campaign to engage parents as their child's first best teacher. As you can imagine, changing the way parents think about their interactions with their children is no easy task. Change happens slowly. In fact, next slide, please. Change happens at the speed of trust. With over 40 years of history and collaborating, we've learned that change only happens at the speed of trust. Social change doesn't come easy. It takes trust. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with an individual who is homeless or near to becoming homeless, talked to them about their financial situation, laid out on paper in hard numbers what needs to be done in order to get them back on track again, and they're not willing to take a chance at it. And you can understand, if you came from a family where your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother have all relied on public assistance to keep their family together, that's probably gonna be the way you're gonna try to do it for your own family. So here I come along telling you about another way where you can develop the skills you need to take care of yourself without having to rely on government assistance. That's a pretty chancy thing to, to opt into. You know the other works. You got three or four generations proving that it works. In fact, we looked at we had an economist look at two scenarios, one where you were looking at somebody whose family has lived off government assistance, and the other where that same family has been struggling to try to make ends meet by developing their own resources. Without knowing the source, to, to each one, every, every time the economist pointed to the family living off government aid and said, this one makes more sense. Of course it does. It's easier to be able to live that way, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily better and that it doesn't help you, you and your family in the long run. Again, this is a, cannot be achieved without building positive working relationships founded in trust and respect. Everything described above is a framework. It's a tool to facilitate collective impact. It's up to each community to come together, begin the envisioning process, and then develop a plan to achieve collective impact. This will look different in every community, and that's okay. As long as the foundation is there, success can still be achieved. Focus on building relationships of trust and respect between community and agency leaders. It's gonna take time, but it's worth it. Let me show you how this evolved in my community and maybe you'll see some par parallels in your own. Next slide. So our collaborative network in Beaufort County dates back to the 1970s. I was a, originally a member of the Beaufort Youth Council when it first got started. In 1976, Beaufort County Council created the Human Services Department in response to the organic network that was forming from the Youth Council. Uh, as you can see, long about 1995, COSI came into existence, and it wasn't long before people started to see the advantages of working together collaboratively and what the outcome could be for the families as well as the agencies that were participating. And so along about 1996, another community collaborative began that we call the Sheldon Township Community Support Partnership. And this is a small grassroots group of community leaders, but they have garnered over $4.3 million to implement an entire array of community programs. Not one paid staff, no office, no fax. They have a PO box. <laughs> That's it. And yet, over the past 20 some years, once a month, community leaders come together around a table with agency representatives, but the agency representatives don't, don't uh, call the shots. They don't set the agenda. The community members set the agenda. 
We're there as agency representatives simply to give the community the information that it asks for when they're working on something. We don't lead the parade, so to speak. And that group in the last 20 years has done amazing things. I don't know about you if you've ever tried to get churches to work together, but that is a tough chore. They have a healthy churches consortium made up of 27 different faith communities, all coordinating to try to have an impact on their local neighborhoods. They get together on every fifth Sunday, whenever there's a fifth Sunday, which happens four times a year, and all the pastors in all those 27 churches deliver the same message so that as a community, they are approaching the problems that have, they have, they're facing their, their residents. One of the challenges they have is obesity. They've done uh, biggest loser competitions. They've started walking clubs. They started community gardens. They have three community gardens, and I'm not talking a little plot of land here. Each of these gardens is several acres. They get out with tractors in the morning to plow and, and plant these fields. And at the end of the harvest, the community comes out, harvests all of the produce, and then takes it around door to door to the shut-ins in their community and provides that food. Whatever's left over is sold at a minimal cost in a community farmer's market. This is just one example. This group has had multiple successes over the years in working with children and the families in their community. Long about 2000, uh, the Early Childhood Coalition started, and that began with the universal staffing team that I just mentioned earlier. And so it, it's clear that once we started to have these kinds of collaborative efforts in our community, and they were like mushrooms popping up all over the place, people just started to realize, hey, we can use that same concept to work with this other population that has complex issues that they're struggling with. Next slide. So working together, we can have a much greater impact in our community than we can if we stay in our silos. It's all about relationships. When we first started, started this work, we found that we had over 500 nonprofits in our area, all of them working independently in silos. One of our advisors from a financial background used this analogy to help us understand what was happening in that situation. So if you picture the back of an old clock where the cogs were all designed to interlock with each other and transfer the move motion from one to the next in order to allow the clock to work. Well, having organizations working in silos is like having all of those cogs disconnected you can have an organization just spinning away, doing all kinds of hellacious work, you know, doing great stuff. But if it's not connected with the rest of the community, 90% of that effort is just wasted. It's not engaging. It's not connecting in the larger machine that is our community. It's disconnected from the rest of the mechanism. Next slide, please. So, at this point, I wanna give you an example, a real life example, and uh, I'm gonna apologize right up front if I get emotional as I tell this story because it's a difficult story to tell, but I think it has an important lesson. A couple of years back, we had a family, a father and mother and three young children. All three kids were preschool age. None of them were in school yet. Mom had never worked. She didn't need to. Her husband was a roofer. He provided a good living uh, for his family. She didn't have a driver's license. She didn't even have a high school diploma. She had never had to have outside employment. She was able to stay home and raise the kids. Well, one day, the father of this family had an accident. He fell off of one of the roofs where he was working and he was never gonna be able to do roofing again. So here we have a family, a mom, dad, and three young children and no way of being able to take care of themselves. Uh, the community services organization, one of our Together for Buford County work groups, the one I referenced earlier that's made up of the churches and nonprofits that provide food, clothing, and shelter, they all came together and they said, you know, if this family is willing to do what it takes to work with the agencies in our community to help them 
get back on their feet. Dad's going to need to go to vocational rehabilitation and learn a new skill. He's never going to be able to do roofing again. So if he's going to become a breadwinner for the family, he's going to have to learn a new career. Mom was going to have to get a driver's license, and study for her GED, because she was probably going to have to get a job outside the home as well in order to, at least for a while, in order to keep things together. But the CSO agreed that as long as this family was doing what everyone had, all the different agencies had them working on in order to become independent, this group was going to fund 100% of their expenses. The family would have zero cost. I mean, everything, food, mortgage, insurance, clothing, entertainment, there would be zero cost. Everything thing would be provided by the pool of funds that were pulled together by these various churches and nonprofits, as long as the family was doing what they needed to do in order to be able to get back on their feet again. So this was working pretty well for about six, seven months. Things were going along really well. And then another group in our community found out what was going on, and they said, we, well, we want to help too. And we said, sure, not a problem. Join us pool your funds with ours and we'll be able to do that much more for the family. And they said, oh, no, no, we want the family to know that it came from us. I said, no, I am not going to hold a family up to public ridicule and say, oh, see these poor people, they need your help. No, they shouldn't have to be embarrassed in order to be able to get help. Well, Buford's a small town. It didn't take much for them to go behind our backs, find out who the family was. They went to the father and they gave him $1,000 in cash. 10 days later, he was dead of a drug overdose because one of the things he was working on was his sobriety. And if you know anything about working with addictions at about six to eight months, you're at a tipping point where it's real easy to fall back into your old habits or if you get the support you need, move forward with your sobriety. This man was handed $1,000 in cash with no accountability. No one, not even his wife, knew he received it. And he just couldn't handle the temptation. So as a result of this organization wanting to get credit, wanting to be known, we have now a mother and three children that have no way of being able to take care of themselves. So it is critical that we learn to work together for the best advantage of our community. Next slide, please. Does everybody remember, everybody remember a few years back when these signs started showing up on vehicles on the highway? Well, our society has collectively agreed that our value as a human being is at its peak the moment we're born. Actually, maybe even before we're born when we first start finding out that mom's pregnant. And from that point on, <laughs> We depreciate in value. Think about the terrible twos, the challenge of raising middle schoolers, and of course, teenagers, the very definition of difficult. Next slide, please. So why don't you ever see this one? We're all keen on helping an abused eight-year-old. Yet when that same individual becomes an adult, we're willing to ignore his or her trauma history and focus on making them take responsibility for themselves. It's the same individual. When we first tried to develop the COSA process, we went to our county council to describe a case study that kind of indicated why it was so important that we do this kind of collaborative work. We had a young man who, from the age of 18 to the age of 23, it's a five-year period, cost our community over $900,000 in that five-year period. Ambulance rides, detention center stays, psych ward stays, drug and alcohol treatment, mental health treatment, and on and on and on. Once we used the COSA process to develop a coordinated plan to assist this individual, he now costs our community about $15,000 a year. He's productive. He's engaged. He has a stable living arrangement. He has an, a stable job. And he's living, living a happy life. The problem child of today will grow into the struggling adult of tomorrow. 
and begin raising their own problem child to start the cycle all over again. But we can break the cycle. Collective impact really works. Thank you for your time. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can turn off your or turn on your microphone and speak um, into your microphone. Good afternoon. This is Joshua Saxa from District 19 in Blackville. Not so much a question, but a comment. Um, <laughs> That story, wow, you know, when helping others there, you know, it's great to realize that there is no big eyes in, in this and that that story alone should be is a prime example why collaboration communication must work, because otherwise it was just someone seeking to get attention for their agency as opposed to really helping the individual. That's, that's tough. Thank you. Yeah, I've that happened probably 10 years ago. I think I've told that story at least 20 or 30 times and it still chokes me up every time I, I say it. I can definitely understand why because it definitely did something for me that is that's just ridiculous. Thank you for sharing that it's a great lesson in that. Thank you. Mr. Lida, we did have some questions from Julia Beatty in the chat. Um, okay. She says she's intrigued by uh, the work that you all are doing, um, but she is wondering how your meetings are facilitated. Um, how do attendees participate in light of COVID-19 restrictions? Um, and really just um, saying that these conversations are crucial and that you did a really great job in Beaufort to facilitate them. Thank you. So actually, the pandemic has had some unintended positive consequences for us. Um, one of the things that we've begun doing is conducting a lot of our meetings virtually, and we have found that we get much better attendance. Um, whether we're talking about agency people or we're talking about family members, it takes a lot. People have to take off from work. They have to be able to get time to drive to the location to be part of the meeting and then drive to get back again it's a lot a bigger commitment than it is if we do things virtually so um, i think the question was geared specifically towards cozy um, as opposed to all the other time kinds of collaborative meetings that we have um, that's the one that is probably the most frequent cozy meets once a week um, we usually staff about four or five families per week we give each family about 30 to 45 minutes discussion for the team. If it's a, a new family that we're hearing for the first time, we'll take 45 minutes so that we have a little bit of time to give some background and for each of the agencies to report out what their involvement with the family has been. And then when they come back for subsequent meetings, for follow-up meetings, they're typically about 30 minutes. Um, the independent facilitator is the person who convenes the group. They also capture all of the ideas and recommendations that are developed by the team, and they write those up. And then at the end of the meeting, they actually provide the parents and the what we call lead agency or contact agency. Um, because with 15 agencies all around the table, you have to decide which one of them is going to be the main agency working with this family. All the others will dovetail their services through that agency. So that lead or point of contact agency um, it also gets a copy of the complete recommendations. And the re recommendations spell out exactly who's doing what. So it will say, we recommend a behavior management specialist work with this child um, six hours a week to reduce aggressive incidents, to, uh, you know, they'll outline exactly what are the behaviors that this, per this service is supposed to be addressing. Um, and all that information, who's gonna be responsible for, for uh, initiating that service. And those recommendations may include that things that mom and dad have to do. You know, dad agrees to go to anger management classes or mom agrees to go to parenting classes. 
um, whatever the resource is that, that the team thinks is gonna be best serving that family. Any other questions? I'm surprised nobody's asking me about the finances of all this. That's usually the, the question that most folks wanna do is how did you pay for this? Well, how did you pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> where does the money come from? Megan Wolf, yes. Uh, where does the money come from? <laughs> So it comes from a wide variety of sources. Um, we don't put all our eggs in one basket. Uh, we never operate off of grants. My mantra is if you live by grants, you will die by grants. Grants are great for trainings, for, for equipment, for things that will become fi fixed assets that you will have access to, but you do not wanna pay salaries or light bills with grants. You need to have a model that generates revenue on its own. So for us, the, the process that started us down that road was cozy as our first collaborative team. And that was that contract with the Department of Health and Human Services that I mentioned earlier. So that allows us to raise funny funds locally. So let's just say for round numbers, I raised $250,000 from local donors, from tax do uh, dollars, from agency contributions. I take that $250 and I send it to Columbia to the Health and Human Services Department. They draw down an equal $250,000 match from the federal government under Medicaid administration. And then I pull down $500,000 to operate my budget. So that's one example. Um, others are the partners themselves contribute. And this is no small feat because you wanna make sure all of your partners have a dog in the, in the fight, that they have money on the table. Um, but a true collaborative is not, uh, um, like I said before, it's not about coming to the table to see with your knife and fork out to say, okay, where's my piece of the pie? It's more about how can my resources be contributed to assist the larger project? You're going to get benefit from it. But if your primary motivation is what are you going to get out of it? That's not a very good collaboration. And Dr. Lida, just to be mindful of the time, um, we do have one more question in the chat. Um, the person is asking, have you ever um, partnered or collaborated with a school in your district? Uh, the school district is probably one of our biggest partners. They um, were probably the, the greatest achievement of our early days was getting our school district. We only have one district in our county, so that makes it easy. Um, but the school district is, I'd say it is the largest refer referral source for COSY. Um, that's where 90% of the referrals of kids come from, which makes sense because that's the one agency in your community that pretty much touches every child. Um, not every kid deals with mental health or alcohol and drug or juvenile justice or DSS. Um, so while those agencies are, are able to make referrals for cases that they have, uh, the primary source for most of our referrals comes from our school district. And our facilitator that, part, that uh, conducts those staffings also participates in uh, uh, TIP hearings. What am I trying to say? Truancy intervention program hearings. So they participate in other meetings that the district holds to discuss children who are struggling with different challenges. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know how many of you all know where your reaction buttons are, but if we can just kind of give Mr. Lida a round of applause and thank him for his time. Um, and it looks like several people uh, plan to get in contact with you. Um, but thank you all again for having <laughs> this session. And um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to Mr. Lida. Thank you all. Please. Thanks everybody. Thank you.